Hi everybody, Stephanie LaFaro here. Um, I am back with my video diary on John Dewey's book Experience in Education. Um, just know that if you found this video, this is more of just a personal um, kind of video blog for myself so I can write a final reflection at the end of the semester. Um, so please don't just rely on what I'm telling you. Um, as you can see, I'm not in my rapid shirt today. They're not playing tonight. Um, and also, I, I hope that you read this book for yourself and just make sure that you're um, again, I think I said that. Um, <laughs> let's just get into it. So um, chapter three, called The Criteria of Experience, um, kind of builds on what he tells us in chapter two. Um, this is the longest chapter in the book here, so if I pause the video, um, it's just so I can kind of collect my thoughts and my notes. Um, this is going to be a little bit choppy as well, because it is the longest chapter in the book. Um, I have tons of notes here, um, and I will just kind of get going. Um, so chapter two, he talks about experience should be worthwhile. Um, so how do we do this? Um, in chapter three, he gives us a framework um, and he kind of re reiterates this idea that he started in chapter two about continuity and worthwhile experience. And by continuity, he means how this experience is going to affect your future experiences. Um, so there's future value in, in that experience. And then he also later talks about growth and development. Um, one thing that sparked my interest as soon as I read this book, uh, read this chapter, um, was how he brought up the harshness of traditional education. Um, and I did some Googling. I didn't quite know what he meant by that. Um, I never really thought of my traditional schooling as harsh. Um, and I'm going to post a blog in the description with this video called Eight Reasons Why Traditional Education System is So Broken. Um, and number eight kind of talks about the digital res revolution in the, work in the workplace and how that might be kind of left out of schools. Um, not so much in that schools and traditional schools certainly can't use a lot of technology, and they, I know they do, um, but it ends with a quote saying, your learning is not confined to prescribed sources like the teacher or four, four walls of the classroom. And what John Dewey is telling us in this whole book uh, really aligns with that. So click on this blog and give it a read if you are listening. Um, I, I know I certainly did. Um, chapter three starts with him kind of talking about uh, reasons why we should prefer progressive over traditional. Um, and he reminds us that the cause of preferring something isn't necessarily the same as the reason for why we should prefer something. Um, and he gives the kind of democratic society that we live in um, as an example for that. Um, and he says that democracy is so ingrained in our society that might be the cause for us to prefer democracy over say socialism or fascism. Um, so we're just inclined to prefer it but it's not the reason as to why we should prefer something. Um, the reason why we should prefer democracy is that it leads to kind of civil discourse and mutual decision-making, um, conversation, the power of persuasion, um, mutual growth, and you know, working together to find reason. Um, those are some reasons why I prefer um, democracy. And so he says that democracy then leads to a higher quality of experience if it's um, involving all of those um, uh, moving parts and he links this took me a really long time to kind of read and I had to read this portion of the chapter about four times um, but he links progressive schools um, to democracy to the quality of experience um, and, and it took me a little while to see that so the first criteria that he mentioned well that I picked out of this book um, he doesn't actually go down and he doesn't have a list these are just my kind of takings from this um, so criteria number one is that the quality of the experience matters and it should always lead to growth um, and he says this in a way that humans are kind of habit forming and I definitely agree we are habit forming creatures um, and that when we come out of an experience we should have kind of a modified behavior at the end and so he re reiterates growth um, and his points made in earlier chapters that growth isn't always good. It doesn't always lead um, to um, educate, like educational goals. Um, so he brings up this idea of like a low level criminal learning some higher crime um, or a child learning to speak or an adult learning to be a lawyer. Um, all of these three people have doors that are open to them through their experience, uh, but we can learn bad habits clearly through poorly orchestrated experiences. Um, and so if that's the case, if we are capable of learning bad habits, uh, what's the role of the educator in experiential learning? And through that, I have picked out five points. Um, and so number one is that educators need to realize that human experience is ultimately social. 
Um, I did bring up in earlier chapters that experiences aren't always um, in groups. Um, you're not always having your experience with somebody else. It could be an experience that you feel, um, like an emotional experience. It could be kind of a transformational experience um, through meditation. Um, however, in the end, if you're coming out of that experience with some kind of modified behavior and going out into society, it is then ultimately social, um, no matter what. And so number two is that an educator's past experience shouldn't be completely ignored. Um, and reiterating his points from the earlier chapters too, he also warns how much of that influence can actually be used um, in order for it to still be a worthwhile experience. Um, you know, the person having that experience should be doing a lot of that work for themselves. And it can't just be, um, it can't be, he talks about that kind of imposition from above in chapter two as well. So we want to, um, less of the instructor, more of the individual working through that experience. Um, number three, the other role of the educator is that they should be aware of the attitudes and the individuals involved. Um, they need to be able to see those individuals creating new habits and judge which ones can align with their growth. Um, and number four, um, limitations and regulations to the experience are also important. Um, and so their past experience shouldn't be completely ignored because the educators have so much knowledge and wisdom. And he kind of likens it to a child um, being raised by a parent. Um, the parent, uh, well, any wise parent, is not going to give in to kind of every want of the child. Um, they're going to meet their needs no matter what, and uh, the parent is going to use their best wisdom um, to guide that child. And so the, the child is obviously kind of off in their own world. Um, the parent is always a part of it. Um, so he kind of likens that. And again, I don't really like to, since I'm in the field of adult education, I'm not always going to be bringing up these analogies, but I think that does kind of reiterate what um, experiential learning might be all about. Um, lastly, number five is that there are external consequences to the experience. It's not just an individual, um, like I said, if you're kind of having a transformational experience, there are still external consequences. It's ultimately social. Um, so your environment matters. Um, and educators need to be able to use this, use their environment, the individual's environment and their context to their advantage. Um, context really matters in progressive school. It's all about um, meeting the changing needs of society and meeting the changing needs of your context and yourself. So um, educators need to shape the context of that learning experience and help them see that. Um, traditional education um, doesn't get this kind of luxury. It doesn't get this contextual um, flavor, I'd say. Um, and traditional schools don't need this, um, but it's absolutely essential in experiential learning to be able to realize your context. Um, with that in mind, this makes progressive education so much more challenging. There are so many subjective conditions. There are um, also objective truths that do have some place and Dewey definitely recognizes that. Um, Dewey says that progressive education align, assigns equal rights to the subjective and the objective. And so unlike traditional education where um, it's not so much contextual, it's just kind of knowledge for the sake of enlightenment, I like to say. Um, and here's when Dewey also offers kind of the best explanation of experience yet. And so he gives us a really good definition. Um, he calls it a, transac a transaction taking place between an, an between an individual and what at the time constitutes his environment. And so he also kind of brings up two words. He says situation and interaction, and it's some kind of situation where there's an interaction going on. Um, and he also likens it to kind of a, an intersection. So you've got um, your continuity, this is your growth, um, and then you have your interaction. And educators need to work in this in this middle of the square to kind of find um, where um, where the experience takes place. Um, the educator has to work into that um, in in that intersection according to each individual, and that's why it's so difficult to kind of get a good hold on experiential learning. Is because every individual is going to have different capacities and different needs, um, and does it really get kind of swept under the rug in traditional schools? Um, in a big classroom, when you have 30 people all kind of doing the same thing, um, how much of the individual's needs and capacities are recognized there? I'm gonna pause for just one second. Whew, okay, so I went through a lot of notes already. 
Um, so I kind of ended that little um, piece there um, talking about um, in, a, in a big classroom where you have all these different people with different capacities and different needs um, and one educator. And does it really get swept under the rug in traditional schools? Um, how many ever times, how many, I'm gonna pause one more time. Right, I'm back, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so we talked about different capacities of the learner, different needs. Um, Dewey says here that knowledge learned in traditional schools is still very precious, but it's stowed away and very segmented. Um, and you kind of pull it out as an ad needed basis. Um, in a classroom with 30 different people all learning the same thing, um, you're just kind of throwing knowledge, like I said, knowledge, knowledge, knowledge at the learner um, without so much that kind of contextual um, awareness of where you're going to need it. Um, and he kind of leads into some final thoughts of the chapter here that are quite poignant with all that in mind. Um, and he kind of asks, I feel like he's kind of asking us, how many times have you ever said to yourself in school, when am I ever going to need this? When am I ever going to need this equation that I'm learning? Um, and this is where he kind of says that knowledge is still very precious. Um, that we don't necessarily learn just the information that we're learning in schools. Uh, we can learn how to do arithmetic and we can learn um, really fancy English. Um, and that's, that's good. It's still very precious, like I said. Um, but more importantly, we do develop certain attitudes and we're capable of learning so much more than just the information we get from teachers in the four walls. Those attitudes that we develop are really what matter in the future. Um, and we really don't know what the future holds. And so traditional education kind of prepares us for some future ideal um, that at the end of the day, it may never come. Um, we can acquire mass amounts of knowledge, um, he says, but he says that we can lose our soul in the process. We're just filling ourselves with knowledge. Um, and I really like how he ends that chapter of we just really don't know what the future holds. And so his kind of plight for progressive education and experiential experiential education are very much kind of illustrated by that thought. Um, and that was the end of the chapter. I will leave it at that and I will see you for chapter four.